In this video I'll be going through the 2021 mechanics paper. Question 1. The picture on the right shows a bike rider going over a ramp. The rider's speed at the top of the ramp is 10 meters per second. The angle between the ramp and the ground is 30 degrees. The top of the ramp is 1.1 meters above the ground. And we see all that represented in our diagram here. Show that the vertical velocity of the rider, just as they leave the top of the ramp, is 5 meters per second. We'll start by drawing our vector triangle. We have our rider's velocity of 10 meters per second, which can be split up into a horizontal component, the angle between which is 30 degrees, as well as our vertical component, and we of course have a right angle. Now in this right angle triangle, our vertical component forms the opposite side, and the other side we know is of course our hypotenuse. As you may have already guessed, we need to use Sokotoa, and because we have the opposite and hypotenuse, we're going to need to use the so part of Sokotoa. And that tells us that sine of the angle, which is our 30 degrees, is equal to our opposite side, which is our velocity in the y-axis, our vertical velocity, but you can call it whatever you wish, divided by our hypotenuse, which is our straight full velocity of 10 meters per second. To solve that for our vertical velocity, we need to multiply both sides by our v, and I'm also going to swap them around, putting our 10 in, and that gives me bang on 5 meters per second. Calculate the maximum height that the rider will reach above the ground. For this, we're going to need to use a kinematic equation. When doing so, it's always good to write down what we know. First of all, we know that the initial velocity vertically is 5 meters per second. We also know, well, hopefully you know, that at the maximum height, the vertical velocity is going to be zero. We know the acceleration due to gravity. And that gives us all we need to know. So when choosing our kinematic equation, we first need to figure out what we don't know. And the one thing that we have no information about at the moment is our time. And the one kinematic equation that does not have time in it is the one kinematic equation that we need in this scenario. Vf squared equals vi squared plus 2ad. Knowing that our vf is zero, we can just get rid of that. And now to solve for our d, our first step is going to be to subtract vi squared from both sides. And I'm also going to swap the sides around again. Lastly, we need to divide both sides by 2a. Putting our numbers in. And that gives me 1.28 meters to three significant figures. But here's the trap. 1.28 meters is not our final answer because the top of the ramp is 1.1 meters above the ground. And we're specifically asked for the height above the ground and they've even bolted it for us. This is a really sneaky move and I guarantee a large amount of students would have fallen for this. And so our final height is going to be our 1.28 meters plus our 1.1 meter, which gives us 2.38 meters. This here would get you an achieved, this here would get you a merit. The diagram below shows the path of the rider when they leave the top of the 30 degree ramp at 10 meters per second. On the same diagram, and without further calculation, sketch the path of a rider who leaves the top of a 40 degree ramp at 10 meters per second. Assume the top of the ramps are in the same place. Now, the key thing to know here is that the optimum launch angle, when we're not considering air resistance, is 45 degrees. And so the closer you are to 45 degrees, the further your object will go. Furthermore, because we are launching the object at a steeper angle, it's also going to go higher. So let's draw that. For a rider leaving the top of a 30 degree ramp at 10 meters per second, calculate the vertical speed of the rider when they land on the ground. And then next we're going to calculate the horizontal distance traveled from the ramp to where the rider lands on the ground. So if we imagine our situation above here, and I'm going to erase my previous answer, let us ignore all of this and just think about this section here. 
Now at this particular moment, our object is traveling downwards with a vertical velocity of five meters per second. How do we know that? Well, casting our mind back, we found that the velocity just as they leave the ramp vertically is five meters per second. And so assuming there aren't any losses to the likes of air resistance, the symmetry of projectile motion means that the velocity here has to be the velocity here. So that simplifies things. Now we have a ball which is traveling downwards at five meters per second. It is accelerating at 9.8 meters per second per second, and it travels a distance of 1.1 meters. And what we want to know is the vertical velocity afterwards. And so once again, we have our initial velocity of five meters per second, our gravitational acceleration of 9.8 meters per second, and our distance of 1.1 meters. Now, once again, you might notice that the thing that we know nothing about, and we're not even trying to find, is our time, which is the same as our situation earlier, meaning that we're going to use the exact same equation. Square rooting both sides to solve for Vf. Putting our numbers in. And that gives me 6.82 meters per second to three significant figures. Now we need to calculate the horizontal distance traveled from the ramp to where the rider lands on the ground. This here is going to be multi-stage. To do this, we need to use our humble velocity equals distance over time, where our x velocity equals our x distance, which we're trying to find, over our time. Solving that for our distance, Problem is, we know neither of these things. Now our horizontal velocity remains constant throughout the journey, and so the horizontal velocity at the start is going to be the horizontal velocity at the finish, and we can find that by going back to question A. Remembering that we have our triangle here, where now we're not interested in our vertical velocity, our opposite, we're instead interested in our horizontal, which is our adjacent. So we need to do exactly what we did here, but instead of using sine, we're going to use cosine. Or in other words, we're going to use the ka component of Sokotoa. That is that cosine of our angle, which is 30 degrees once again, is our adjacent side, which is our vx, divided by our hypotenuse, which is our velocity. To solve for vx, we multiply both sides by v, and now we just need to put our 10 meters per second in. Which gives me 8.66 meters per second. Now we need to find our travel time. Now this travel time is going to be kind of twofold. Because we can break it down into the time it takes for the ball to travel this path. And then add on the time it takes for it to travel this path. So what we're going to do is we're going to first find the time it takes for it to travel to its maximum height, where we know that the vertical velocity is zero. Having found this time, we will know that we can double it to find the whole time. Then we need to find this time, which we can just add on. Now in terms of equation, we can use this one here. Solving that for time, subtracting vi from both sides and then dividing by acceleration, the time to reach our peak is going to be our vf, which is zero, minus our initial velocity vertically, which is five. Then dividing that by our acceleration, which is negative 9.8. And that gives me 0.51 seconds. We can then double it to find our t1, the first part of our time, which gives me 1.02 seconds. What I mean by t1, is this section of our flight here. Our T2 is this one here. So let's find that now. Recycling our equation earlier, our Vf is our 6.82 we just found before. Our initial velocity was our 5, and our acceleration was our 9.8. And that gives me 0 0.1857 seconds. So our final time, is the sum of our times, t1 plus t2, which gives me 1.21 seconds, 
And we're now ready to find our distance. And that gives me 10.5 meters to three significant figures. Question two, a rider rides around a circular bend of radius seven meters at a constant speed of 10 meters per second. If the combined mass of the rider and bike is 90 kgs, calculate the centripetal force required. Centripetal force is found using this equation here, where we know the mass, we know the velocity, and we know the radius, which gives me 1,300 newtons to two significant figures. When the rider is in the position below, they bike across a very slippery part of the track. Use physics principles to explain the path the rider takes when they bike across the very slippery part of the track. Show this path on the diagram with an arrow. What we need to recognize here is that before the rider enters the very slippery part of the track, they are going to have a centripetal force which is keeping them in this circle. Their velocity is going to be at right angles to this force or at tangent to the circle. As long as this force is acting, our velocity vector is going to keep turning towards the center of the circle in this direction here. If that force were to disappear, however, which we're assuming is happening as they enter the very slippery part of the track, there will be no force acting to change the direction of the velocity. And so our rider is going to follow this path here. So let's explain this below. When the rider enters the slippery part of the track, the centripetal force vanishes. As there is no longer any acceleration, the tangential velocity no longer changes. The rider therefore exits the track at a tangent to the circle. Question C. Some trail bikes have a spring suspension system. The spring constant is 40,000 newtons per meter. A rider of mass 80 kgs sits on the bike causing the spring to compress. Calculate how much energy is stored in the compressed spring. The equation for the energy in a spring is this one here. Where we know the spring constant here, but we don't know the displacement. So we need to find that. Fortunately, we also have this equation here, where the force in question is our gravitational force, which is just our mass times gravity. Solving this for x by dividing both sides by negative k. And since we're only interested in the magnitude here, we can ignore our negative. This really is only there to signify that the force and the displacement are in opposite directions. And we can now just put our numbers in. And that gives me 0 0.0196 meters, which means we're ready to use this equation here. And that gives me 7.7 .7 joules to two significant figures. When a rider lands after a jump, they essentially have a collision with the ground. Use physics principles to explain fully how a suspension system makes a bike safer for landing. The key idea being assessed in this question is that of impulse. Specifically that the force is the change in momentum divided by the time. We have the same change in momentum, but because we increase the duration of our collision using our springs, we reduce the force. The use of springs increases the duration of the collision. As the change in momentum is constant, the equation f equals delta p over delta t shows that an increase in duration decreases the force. A smaller force means a smaller risk of injury. Question three. A rider and bike with a combined mass of 85 kgs climb four meters vertically in three seconds while biking up a track. Calculate the average power required. The equation for power is work over time, where we know our time, but we don't yet know our work. Since the work is done against gravity, we're interested in the gravitational potential energy, given by this equation here. Where we know the mass is our 85, we know the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8, and we know our height, giving me 3,332 joules. Putting that into our power equation, gives me 1,100 watts to two significant figures. The rider bikes over a four meter long bridge and stops three meters from the end, 
The bridge has a uniform mass of 700 kilograms. The combined mass of the rider and bike is 85 kilograms. State the conditions required for the bridge to be in equilibrium. For this we need no net force and no net torque. Draw labelled arrows to represent all the forces acting on the bridge. First of all we have the forces from our supports. Now the forces from support A is going to be larger than that of support B as the rider is closer to that end. And looking up to our masses, we see that the mass of the rider is 85, while the mass of the bridge is 700, considerably larger, and so too will therefore be the force. So the force from our bike and the rider acts from their position downwards, and the weight force of the bridge acts from its middle. Calculate the values of all the forces acting on the bridge, which is going to require a bit of groundwork. Let's start off with the easy ones. We can find the force of our rider. Knowing that that is a gravitational force, and so we need to multiply its mass by the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8, which gives me 833 newtons. We can do the same for the weight force of our bridge giving me 6,860 newtons. Now we need to find one of our support forces. And since we're given the distances to B, we might as well choose B as our pivot and find the force of A. So choosing B as our pivot, we know that the clockwise torques must equal our counterclockwise torques. We know this because the bridge is in equilibrium and that is one of the conditions. Now our only clockwise torque is our Fa. The torque of Fa is given by its distance of 4 meters multiplied by the force itself, which we're trying to find. As for our counterclockwise torques, they are produced from the force of our rider and the force of our bridge. Once again, their torques are going to be their distances times their forces. The distance of the rider is 3 meters multiplied by their force. And the distance to the weight force of the bridge is going to be half our 4 meters, which is going to be 2 meters. We can solve for Fa by dividing both sides by 4. Putting our numbers in. Gives me 4055 newtons to 4 significant figures. And just to note, I'm reporting these to more significant figures than I would for a final answer because I'm still working with these values and I want to minimize the rounding errors we might otherwise have. Now to find the force from our support B, we don't need to look at the torques at all, we just need to look at the balancing of the forces. And so we have our two upwards forces, FA and FB, and we know that they must equal the downwards forces. Solving this for FB by subtracting FA from both sides. Putting our numbers in. Giving me 3638 newtons. And we're done.